first pot of the Players' Championship. On your left is Jonathan Hobbs. On your right is Collins Mullen. Grixis Delver against Hogak here in our legacy portion of pod play. And we'll get in kind of some of the uh, other fun stuff that will be happening over the course of this tournament. You can find out all about the tournament format over at StarCityGames.com. And unfortunately here for Jonathan Hobbs, we see who's on the play, Patrick. Yeah, really bad news. Step one, I think, for, for Hobbs in this matchup is winning the roll, and that did not happen. An underground C there off of a Misty Rainforest means that Collins Mullen will be at 19. Let's see how he wants to move forward on his first turn of the game. Underground C, the key land in this deck, allows him to play Hedron Crab and Gravecrawler and Stitcher Supplier. Now, it is worth noting that's not really all that scary of a start. It's not a Supplier or a Hedron Crab. Well, I think that Mullen does not want to just run a Hedron Crab out there and expose it to Lightning Bolt. Sure. He's probably got a hand that can slow play his architecture a little bit. Uh, start off with some just some attackers and then try to set up multiple key pieces in a turn. Probably try to play around days as well with his key spells as best he can. Grape Collar going to come into the red zone here. Hobbs predictably not going to block, so he'll fall down to 18. Mullins will follow, thing up, follow things up here, pardon me, with a Bloodstained Mire. He'll fall down to 18. Again, do remember this is Legacy, not Modern, where Hogak really made its huge debut thanks to its printing and what we saw in Hogak Summer. Instead, you get to actually search for dual lands as opposed to shock lands. So, and this is why I was speaking about play versus draw. If Hobbs was on the play here, and this was his second turn, and he had a wasteland for that underground C, you'd think he'd have a, a good shot in the game. For sure. Well, this is a pretty normalized draw here from Collins Mullen. Going to go with a blood gas now. Well, we know that he has Heach and Crab in hand. Mm -hmm. We've seen that. So I think Mullen's line here is he wants to play around days as best he can. And so start off with the Grave Crawler. Turn two, Blood Ghast. If that gets days, two cares. It's now it's in the graveyard. You get it back. I think turn three, we're going to see some fireworks here from Mullen uh, with a hand that can play around days. Well, this will be a Thought Seize. And there is a Dryad Arbor, a Hedron Crab, and I believe an Altar of Dementia along with another fetch land there for Collins Mullen. So not the toughest hand for Hobbs to pick apart, especially if he has like a Force of Will to counter the next thing. And it looks like he does have a copy of Force Will. Not entirely sure if he has another blue card there, but the one thing he's missing right now is having that Delver transform. Yeah, Hobbs has got to shorten the length of the game. Really important to get to Insect Dial Aberration as fast as possible uh, because even his disruptive draws are only going to be able to fend off Mullen for so long. He's got to get some pressure. Hobbs does have a copy of Wasteland in hand, but this is a world of difference between being on the play and on the draw, as you did mention. Wasteland not looking so appealing, especially when you thought sees your opponent. They have not one but two lands in hand. Makes you not want to fire off Wasteland at all. So Hobbs thinking pretty long and hard about what he wants to select with this Thought Seize. Also worth noting, in addition to Jonathan's successes that he's had on the SCG Tour, he played in his first Mythic Championship this year and actually just won PTQ last weekend with Simic Flash and Standard. So uh, the resume is continuing to build for the youngster from Indiana. And with a 2-0 start here, if he's able to somehow get by this matchup, life will be pretty good. There's your attack for one. Blood Gas can't block, of course. Alter Dementia was the selection. Uh, there's an underground sea. Excuse me, there's a volcanic island. That's Delver of Secrets. And, well, you see the plan, Patrick. Yep. Hopefully race. Hopefully this Hedron Crab doesn't yield anything too explosive too fast. And hope that Mullen just has some bad draw steps because this deck produces plenty of bad draw steps. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a Hedron Crab. Now there's a Verdant Catacomb. So you need to fade here a little bit. Hogak is not a fade. Hogak has been placed into the graveyard along with a copy of Blood Gas, so it's getting bad here for Hobbs. Yeah, and I think even at this point, if the uh, Delvers were to transform next turn, we're still just not looking at nearly enough pressure uh, to get the game over with before Mullins overwhelms him. Well, I've got a little bit of experience playing with Hogak, and I'm sure you've got plenty of experience playing against it uh, with Burn. It's uh, tough to race an 80 Trampler. No, it's pretty big yeah. you know it's, it's can't can't fail to push it this is cost too much mana yeah it's it's a lot yeah that card's a lot it's weird because they play for zero so often and yet you can't push it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to fatally push a building yeah because that's it's what true. it is can't really push those around 
Looks like here's a Stitcher Supply. That looks like that was the draw step there for Colin, so he'll trigger that zombie. Three cards are going to go in the graveyard. Misty Rainforest, Underground Sea, and a Verdant Catacombs head to the graveyard. Couple of goodies there, though, in the graveyard from that Hedron Grab trigger. First one was Hogak, second one was Blood Gas. So you see one thing that Mullins does quite a bit when he is playing Dredge-esque strategies is separating his graveyard for what he wants and doesn't want. I, I know, I'm not trying to get... Collins into trouble here or anything. Mm -hmm. I thought this was not permitted in Legacy. Oh, there are sure, cards that sure. affect your graveyard order or or, or predicated on uh, graveyard stuff order. like Shallow Grave. Sure, Death Spark, Nether Shadow, Ashen those, Ghoul. A lot of the cards you just mentioned, people have never heard of. Okay, I think that only matters if it, well, I don't want to say it only matters if it's in your if, if that stuff's in your deck because that's not yeah, true. Yeah, and it, it, it doesn't matter here, deck list or public and yes. whatever. But my understanding was you actually in the formats where the order matters, you oh. have to keep it a certain way. It's a good thing they don't have that in the rules anymore, really. Uh, I, I know all, I know all the rules yes. for the old formats. Yeah, here's a here's a preordained invitation. A couple of years ago, I was competing in, called over a judge, stopped a match in progress. Why? Two enchant worlds on the battlefield. I <laughs> illegal. Neither player knew, but you know what? I certainly would know. You may not have the Nether Void and the Abyss on the battlefield at the same time. Preordain's not going to yield what Hobbs is looking for, and he's going to concede <laughs> the game right away because Hogak is much too large for him to stop. So Collins Mullen's going to win game number one here over Jonathan Hobbs. Hogak up a game over Grixis Delvers. We take a look at the sideboards. For Hobbs, it's three Pyroblast, two Plague Engineer, two Surgical Extraction, two Abrade. And we've got some one ups here Null Rod, Spell Pierce, Tyrant Scorn, and Flusterstorm, Dread of Night, and Tormod's Crypt. Uh, so the Tormod's Crypt and the two Surgical Engineer extractions obviously stand out here as ways to interact with the graveyard. I think Plague Engineer is okay in this matchup as well. So there are enough uh, zombies and such floating around that you can meaningfully shrink. For Collins Mullen, who was fairly quickly up a game, he's got four Force of Vigor, four Leyland of the Void, three Abrupt Decay. Two thought season, Assassin's Trophy, and a Cabal Therapy. I know you're uh, oftentimes a fan of Same 60. Well, I think in this sort of matchup, uh, I, I don't mind bringing in uh, answers to the battlefield in Abrupt Decay and Assassin's Trophy. It makes me a little nervous to do it on uh, the draw because it's two mana against a deck with days, in the case of Assassin's Trophy, and Wasteland. But I think the interaction is still good enough uh, because if you if you blunt Hobbs' as early pressure, then you can do everything at your leisure. It's really easy to play around, even cards like Surgical Extraction and Tormod's Crypt. So even if they are a little shaky on the draw, they increase ex exposure a little bit to Wasteland. I think they're still good enough to bring in. All right, fair enough. Well, I will say Hobbs being on the play here for game number two is pretty important. Zach White on Twitter letting us know about the legacy ordering that it's technically illegal to change your graveyard, but it's only really going to be enforced if there are cards that matter. Which, as you mentioned, in legacy no death spark, no other. Well, uh, someone has to have it in their deck. I think yes. is the in implication there. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so it's good to have that clarity. Well, I don't know if that's clear. Technically illegal, but only if there's some information known is. Not the easiest thing to rule on. Sure. But whatever. Sure. Doesn't matter. He does not playing with Death Spark. That's true. It, thankfully. Thankfully. Uh, Collins is going to take a moment to gather himself for game number two, which gives us a perfect time to take a look at the Season 1 2020 SCD Tour schedule. We'll be kicking things off in Columbus, Ohio, one of my favorite cities that I got to visit last month for a Team Modern Open, much like how we kicked off this year. It was a very successful tournament. And then our return to Knoxville here on the SCG Tour. Yep, and then in February, we're going to go to Richmond, Philadelphia, and Indianapolis with two team constructed opens and a Pioneer Open. Then we'll have the regional championships, which will be modern March 7th. You can head over to go.crcgames.com slash regionals. We get a little bit closer to that tournament for more information. Baltimore, another Pioneer Open. And then the rest of Season 1, format's not yet announced, but we do have venues and dates with Syracuse. And then after Syracuse, Atlanta, Worcester, and Cincinnati. Louisville and Philadelphia run out May, and then SCG Com Summer, uh, featuring the Star City Games Invitational June 11th through 14th. Should be a lot of fun. Go to starcitygamescom schedule for more information about all these events. Start getting registered for these today. Columbus is going to be here before you know it. I know that we are uh, technically, what are we, in the middle of December, I guess? What is it today? I think the, yeah. the 12th? Uh, 12th. Dates, they all just kind of start to Blurring blend together. 13th, 13th. we've okay. been informed. I'll update. It's the third. You gonna update the watch there? Yeah. Or? Okay. 
That's all right. That's all right. We'll catch back up there. Uh, Jonathan Hobbs, unfortunately for him, down a game. Collins Mullen up a game as we work our way through the third round of pod play here, getting the legacy portion of things out of the way at the jump. Legacy, a format we have had a lot of here on the SD Tour over the entire decade, making the shift towards Pioneer next year, which I'm looking forward to. I've enjoyed my time covering a lot of Legacy, and perhaps it will be back. But Pioneer is going to be kind of moving towards the forefront, which is also a very good format. Yep, and uh, it's, it's interesting to see a format where... It the iteration is happening so fast. Uh, part of that is it's a new format. The other part of it is Wizards has taken a position of banning very aggressively. And so uh, the information that's flowing in and the decks that are emerging, it's evolving very, very fast, which is cool to watch. I've enjoyed the format. Um, Mono Black Aggro being one of the best decks, Mono Green Devotion being one of the best decks. Unclear what the best deck is right now. I'm sure that Todd Anderson is probably working on that right now. Um, but, you know, if he's not, I'm sure the members of Team Lotus Box are, much like Collins Mullen, who has really put on quite the display here this year, uh, along with the rest of Team Lotus Box. You know, the best performing team on the SCG Tour, and they've gotten four members into the Players' Championship. The 24-year-old from Durham, North Carolina. In 2019, he played 18 Opens, top eight at four of them all time. He's got 11 top eights with one win, Humans, back in Cincinnati a couple of years ago. First time we'd ever seen that deck. He crushed that Open with two Invitational top eights as well for Collins. Enjoys himself some rock climbing, bouldering, and casting Hogak in many a format, including Legacy. Uh, I think the 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 dual issue of, you know, the Modern Horizons, very modern-focused set, and then Hogak uh, being so dominant there, uh, not much attention was given, relatively speaking, to this strategy in Legacy, mm -hmm. uh, but it's extremely powerful here as well. Uh, you get a lot of the upside of Reanimator, of playing in a different zone, without nearly the same exposure to the anti-graveyard cyborg cards people have. You can play around that stuff pretty easily. Yeah, surgical attraction is certainly not the end of the world. That is for sure. So both of these players will take a look at their opening hands, and we will see that they're both going to keep. And now here's a preordain. Would have preferred for that to be a Delver of Secrets, but a cantrip isn't so bad. But this is actually one of the times where doing something with the Wasteland is actually pretty nice. And Hobbs actually has a Delver in hand, so maybe a little surprised. So we'll head back over to Collins. We'll see what his first turn will yield. If you do want to take a look at the bios for each player, our friends over at Cardboard Live have provided that along with the deck list, so you can learn more about each player. In this instance, Jonathan Hobbs and Collins Mullen, along with how they qualified for the Players' Championship. Hobbs was the last one in... And Mullen, one of the last people in, but Hobbs was actually the last one in, edging out Ross Merriam to qualify for the Players' Championship. Been a nice invite there for Ross, living in the city and all. Yeah. There's a Stitcher Supplier, and there'll be a trigger here. If this does resolve, Days could take care of this. It looks like Force of Will is going to stop this. So this is what you were talking about at the jump about trying to stop an enabler just one you know that's the hope is some of mullen's hands will be really leaning on one card to get anything going mm -hmm. and if you answer that card his hand might be a dead end or he might keep a lot of one landers and uh wasteland can break that up too well delver secrets has been exiled now too so i'm curious what hobbs's plan is to get something going and well it's become readily apparent he's going mm -hmm. to rely on a young pyromancer to get the job done as he has an underground sea and a volcanic island to cast the powerful two one yeah, no turn one Delver, instead playing Preordain, uh, would suggest to me a one land hand with some really good two mana card to pay it off. And uh, it looks like that was the case. I think Hobbs topped the Scalding Tarn last turn to get to mana number two. Now he has a young Pyromancer on the battlefield. Mullen, that's not that good at killing stuff post board, uh, Abrupt Decay and Assassin's Trophy. Uh, but not all of the cards in the world to work with here. And if this is able to stick, uh, Hobbs might be able to overwhelm Mullen in short order. What's unique about this is this kind of setting things up for Young Pyromancer on turn two, and then maybe trying to go Berserk on turn three, as here's a Hedron Crab. This would not work on the draw. No chance. I think this is only only reasonable on the play here for Hobbs. Yeah, Hobbs has a lot of angles and dimensions. Now, the matchup's still not good for him, but uh, a lot of what his deck does is so much better on the play than on draw. It almost doesn't work on the draw. On the play, these kind of lines... They have a shot. It's still tough, but he's got a shot. 
for Mullen. He has milled over a Venge Vine, Alter Dementia, and a Fetch Land with the Hedron Crab. Hobbs has set his hand down, so now if you're Jonathan, you're hoping that Venge Vine doesn't make its way back from the graveyard onto the battlefield right away. Well, is the hand down, I'm F6-ing, I'm checking out of this, do your thing, or is it I'm trying to trick you about surgical extraction? We'll have to see. He'll sacrifice a bloodstained mire here, Will Mullen. That's I do, a uh, underground sea. I do the put my hand down with the zero mana spell in my hand a lot. Oh, is that your move? Yeah. Nice. It's good to have a move. I have a couple moves. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a trigger for me drawing crab now. Three more cards will be heading to the graveyard in just a moment here for Collins Mullen. One is a crab, two is an abrupt decay, and three is another venge vine. Does Mullen just pass the turn back? Fortunately for Hobbs, he does, so no Vengevine's coming back from the graveyard. So, for Jonathan Hobbs in his third turn of the game, he needs to really get a move on here. He's going to start things off with a Thought Seize, which, oddly enough, I don't think is a bad place to start. Let's see what's going on. What's the texture of Collins Mullen's hand? Well, we know it does not evolve another one-mana creature. Mm -hmm. We've seen that last turn. Looks like a couple copies of Bloodgast, among other things, so... See if Collins can still cobble together enough to do things with Vengevine next turn, but he wasn't able to do it this turn. I do apologize for the glare at home for those of you who can't make out those cards. A swamp, a couple copies of Blood Gas, another Fetch Land, as well for the Hedron Crab. There we go. There's also okay. So it's a Hogak. That's the card in the middle. It's not the best hand to thought sees. No, it's really not. The Hogak is the same in the graveyard. The blood gas is actively better. So I'm guessing you take the Hogak. I think so. You you don't have to really worry about one of the things you you don't want to do is you don't want to make it so that blood gas can. Two bloodcasts can hit the battlefield at the same time, right? right? So if you if you put one in the graveyard and you leave one in hand, that means you can hard cast one, play a land, get the other one back, and then actually cast a Hogak right now. So I, I think with that in mind, I, I would like the idea of sa of selecting Hogak. It looks like Hobbs is going to go towards selecting Bloodgast. I'm a little surprised by that selection, but maybe there's something I'm missing. Surgical extraction, maybe? That could be it. But it's not bad to extract Hogak either. Or... The bench fine? Yeah, know. there's a lot of surgical extraction yeah. targets. That's a problem. That's why surgical is not quite good enough in this spot. You want to take care of a lot of different things. Now, there's a fetch land. There will be a trigger. A couple of them, actually. One for Hedron Crab and one for Bloodgast. So that's where Mullen wants to start things. See, for Hobbs, he's got that young Byromancer, an elemental token. And now, okay, so there's the surgical. And now, if the thought process here is, I'm going to take all of your blood gas, I know your hand, you can't really do all that much. Well, okay, he's, well, this is awkward because he's revealed surgical extraction, but he's not going to cast it. Okay. So I don't know what the heck's going on now. It seems like the the blood gas is just the most threatening card there by a mile. If you tag him in his draw step, he's just got Hogak and nothing going and, on. And nothing outside of whatever he drew. And so unlikely to be able to do anything with the Venge Vines mm -hmm. the next turn also. Because Hogak in, in... If you tag those blood gas, Hogak in Mullen's hand is, is a dead card. Right. It doesn't do anything. So I'm a little surprised at letting the blood gas... Well... I'm surprised that we got to this point where if you're going to take Bloodgast, you surgical it on your own turn. Or you surgical it in the draw, draw step. step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't let a fetch land come down because now, if you surgical the Bloodgast now, Collins will just sacrifice the fetch land, trigger the Bloodgast and the crab again, and get back the Bloodgast. So surgical does not poke a hole in that. And it's all public information, too. Mm -hmm. You saw the hand last turn from the Thoughtseize, so maybe it would be different if you knew Mullen didn't have a fetch land ready to go, but did know about it. 
So a bit of a misstep there for Hobbs to be sure, because it looks like Collins has the ability to play a Bloodgast and cast a... Actually, cast a Bloodgast, cast a Hogak with the Convoke, trigger the Venge Vines, and that's where the Surgical Extraction will be forced to go then, yep. is on those Venge Vines. Looks like we're going to go towards Cabal Therapy first, which is interesting. Well, another issue here with the with the Surgical Extraction line is that uh, uh, it just increases sort of generalized exposure to cards that Mullen can mill off the top. Mm -hmm. Like, this Cabal Therapy, for example, would have nothing to do if the blood gas weren't part of the equation. Sure. It looks like he might be therapying himself. As his hand is now... Well, actually, the hand is face up because of surgical extraction. So you see the hand of Bloodgast, Hogak, Bridge from Below, and a Swamp. So you think about it. If that surgical extraction took care of Bloodgast in the draw step, we're looking at a hand that would have been Bridge from Below, Hogak, and a land. Right. And that's and, it. And a lot of bad stuff can still happen. Absolutely. If, if Mullen crabs over the right cards. Mm -hmm. But based on what you know about his hand and Graveyard presently, uh, he wouldn't have much to do. I think Hobbs would have been a pretty big favorite then, at least in the short term. But as things currently stand, looks like this game is getting more and more difficult here for Jonathan Hobbs. And it's not like he has a lot of resources left in hand. We know these Delver decks are light resource decks that just try to cross the finish line in time. I think the remaining card in hand is Brazen Borrower, which Ooh, is not correct. Not bad here. Um, you can fend off Hogak for uh, a turn and then um, get your 3-1 flyer going and maybe win the race. There are worse draws. Yeah. There were straws. But it is all about winning that race, as you did mention. We are in a racing scenario, so Petty Theft and Brazen Borrower. You do see the Brazen Borrower right now. A very, very popular card from Thrones of Eldraine, which is starting to get popular across many, many formats. Its versatility and it being a pretty high-power flyer has made it a multi-format all-star. And there's some analogs, a lot of different analogs to Vendelian Click, and one of them is, what's this card good against? And it's just like decks in general. It's very flexible. It's a, a lot of power. It's a card that's good against cards. Yeah. All sorts of cards. Dried Arbor off the fetch of the Verdant, with the Verdant Catacombs, pardon me. You also get a Hedron Crab trigger in just a moment. So there go three cards. And you see Dry Darbor is going to move up into the creature area, at least for right now. It is summoning sick, of course. Interesting there that Mullen named a... Uh, uh, appears to name Plague Engineer mm -hmm. with the Cabal Therapy, which is a threatening card here, but Hobbs gave away a little bit of the information about what was going on in his hand by using Phyrexian Mana to cast the Surgical Extraction. This game could easily come down to a tight damage race. The two life that Hobbs is playing there is not trivial. And so if he's doing that, it means that he has something really important to do with two mana. The information might have been there for Mullen to name uh, Brazen Borrower, particularly because it's also really good in this spot. Getting the Hogak off the battlefield for one turn, and then there's a 3-1 flyer that you can't really block coming down the next turn. Um, that, that, that card is pretty good in this spot. And so I think that Hobbs gave away enough information that I would prefer for Mullen to name something other than that. I would not. I guess I would not have named Plague Engineer. Um, because it's just so unlikely that the last card in his hand is a three-mana card if he's willing to pay the two life on the uh, surgical extraction. Hmm, Petty Theft is going to resolve. It's going to bounce Hogak, which means that Young Pyromancer is going to make another token. And now we've got Brazen Borrower on an adventure. And don't forget, you can play that thing as an instant. So the race is certainly on here, folks. And it's up to Hops to draw a pretty good one. Dried Arbor doing a lot of work in the spot, too, because um, uh, that is a blocker for Young Pyromancer. That substantially slows down Hobbs' clock here. Yeah, that's a bit of an issue here. He likes to attack with all the creatures. Heatron Crab can block one of the 1-1s one because it's an 0-2, and Dried Arbor is fending off the Young Pyromancer so much, in fact, that the Young Pyromancer's not even going to attack. Don't really want to offer up a trade there, it appears. Right. 4 damage versus 2 is so different in the spot. 
Well, if we're going to race, Trinity Nemesis isn't a bad place to do it. Good blocker on the first turn. Great attacker moving forward. Yeah, it complicates combat the coming turn for Mullen, and then also is a way to race. You know, Hobbs is just barely hanging on here. It does not take a whole lot from Mullen to overwhelm him here, uh, especially if he's left in copies of Alter Dementia. But it's tight. I mean, the game is kind of going the way that Hobbs would like it to. The matchup's still very tricky, but he does have a hope of winning the race here before getting completely overpowered. Three cards placed in the graveyard from a Hedron Crab trigger there for Collins Mullen. Doesn't look like much to note. Again, remember there's a Hogak and a bridge from below in hand here for Collins. And I believe he's got enough stuff in the graveyard in combination with Convoke to redeploy Hogak. So there is your 8-8 Trampler. So Collins will exile some of the cards from his graveyard. For the Delve, we head back over to Mullen. I do remember, excuse me, we head back over to Hobbs. Do remember, Hobbs does have that Brazen Borrow that's on an adventure. It's not on the battlefield just yet. That's on the top of your screen. True Day Nemesis, three elemental tokens, Young Pyromancer, they are on the battlefield. And it's a draw step here for Hobbs, and a very, very important one as a smile starts to come across his face a little bit. So perhaps it was a good one. Well, this attack knocks Mullen down to 10. In theory, you have Brazen Borrower plus Trinity Nemesis. That gets him down to four. And that's going to leave you pretty short. Um, there are, of course, some draw steps, notably Lightning Bolt, that alongside your Young Power Manager, the Elemental Tokens, maybe you can shorten the length of the game here. But if you're looking at three turns worth of combat, this and the next two to win this game, I just don't know if Hobbs can hold on long enough. I think that might be a little bit too slow. Really important if to try to take a turn out of this game, if possible. Well, I think that's the easy place to start, which a true nemesis is going to come across here for three points of damage. So Mullen is going to fall down to ten, which you knew that was already going to happen. And now Mullen, I think, may have picked up a copy of Altered Dementia for the draw step. Well, that might trivialize the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Altered Dementia might just allow Mullen to win the game this turn if it resolves. Well, I think this is the easy place to start here for Collins, which is, let me get in here with Hogak and two Bloodcasts. That'll be 12 points of damage that's attacking through. And my instinct here, if you're Hobbs, is just, you gotta take it all. Yeah, you just gotta, go to one. You, go to one. It doesn't really change anything, but you need, it, it's possible you just need every elemental available to be able to win the game next turn, assuming you're fortunate enough to draw Lightning Bolt. There's not a whole lot to be done by blocking. The Hogak has Trample, the Blood Gas come right back, and Mullen is not going to burn you out here. So the difference between 1 and 3 or 5 is just not significant. But you want to be able to attack for the win in combination it's just, with Lightning Bolt You don't know if it matters or not. Mm -hmm. You don't know if it's going to come down to 1 Elemental, but it might, and I just don't think there's any valuable gain by blocking here. Well, it's a little bit unique, as you see both of these creatures are going to block. The blood gas and the young pyromancer tokens are going to trade. Is that can we attack for lethal now? It looks like the answer is no, because young pyromancer would get blocked by dried arbor, elemental token gets blocked by hedron crab. If the brazen borrower comes in in combination with train nemesis, that gets Collins down to four, not three. And now there's the altar. And it looks like the altar is going to resolve. So will Mullen go crazy with this thing or not? Does he even need to? He certainly can try. I mean, it's one card in hand on the other side there. Hobbs does not have a whole lot that can stop it from here. I think you just assume the last one in there is a blank. You would have, you would have, if he had a good response, you would have seen it by now. Yeah, it looks like Hogak is going to be sacrificed, so uh, quite a few cards are going to be headed to the graveyard now. Also, Hobbs is down to one surgical extraction as a possibility here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, again, I, th I think you would have seen it by now. So just. Say let it rip. Well, he's gonna let it rip. So I think it's so much more likely that Hobbs top decks a lightning bolt and kills you next turn than he has some card in his hand right now that does anything. Most cards he would have cast. Right, you would have, just would have seen it by Any now. Any of the cantrip stuff like that, I think he would have done already. So we're gonna see a green mana here like, get tapped off the dried arbor. If he had force of negation, you just would have seen it on the altar. There's mm -hmm. no way, you know, that he would 
allow it to resolve in the spot. There's Cabal Therapy among the cards. Name that tune, Collins Mullen. If you can. Delver. So, nothing. And deploying Delver as opposed to deploying... Tr uh, de as opposed to deploying... Brazen Borrow, it's the same thing. Right, might as well use all your mana. Leave mm -hmm. a blue card in your hand, maybe yep. for something down the road. There's a land, gonna trigger the blood gas. Also got a zombie from the sacrifice because Bridge from Blows in the graveyard. I mean, it's entirely possible that this turn Jonathan Hobbs gets milled out after Collins Mullen mills his entire uh, library or most Yeah, of I, it. I think from here we're just gonna... It, it's just not that hard for, for Mullen to... Flip over his whole deck this turn and then do the same thing to Hobbs. There's a Cabal Therapy again. Yeah, I think Second Bridge actually is now deterministic. Yeah, once he targets himself with that Cabal Therapy, which is exactly what he did, so he'll sacrifice a Blood Ghast to the altar. Get two zombies. Gonna mill a couple of cards. I think finding a. Uh, Finding a grave crawler makes things a little bit easier too. Not necessary to have it, but certainly does make things a touch easier with regards to milling yourself and then milling your opponent. This is what we saw at the early stages of Hogak Summer, when this was a deck that people were playing in modern. It was all legal, folks. Well, uh, now I, I think he's just infinite, right? Because every sack of Hogak mill makes two zombies and mills over for more than the number of cards you need to delve the Hogak back. So you're going infinite here, essentially, on uh, Hogak cast, and once you're there, you start netting resources, which you can then pull enough of them to mill out your opponent. Yeah, because you've got more bridges to work with, too. As yeah. opposed to just one bridge, you're going to have multiples, yeah. and so this would be the uh, proverbial inf infinite. Even infinite. assuming there was no engine left in Mullen's deck to mill over, mm -hmm. I think he would still have enough to go from here, and he's going to just hit additional copies of Gravecrawler, Bridge from Below, whatever along the way. Um, to make this even easier. Well, Ultra Dementia is not a card that does things on its own. It needs a little bit of help, and so far as it needs creatures to work with, and it's got quite a few here in these zombies and blood gas and hogax. And I think soon enough, Collins Mullen is going to be moving on to a 2-0 victory, and more importantly, a 3 0 of his pod with Hogak, which again, the most played deck tied with uh, Saltai Snow here in Legacy. Didn't expect Hogak to, to be one of our most played decks, given how much people love their brainstorms and such. But look, if the hate's not going to be there. No. And, I mean, Hobbs drew a surgical this game. It wasn't even like there was no hate. Just yeah. It wasn't good enough, that's for sure. And one thing to note is you're going to see the milling of Hobbs start to take place now is that when you're playing in an open field tournament like this, you have access to your opponent's main deck and sideboard when you're playing. And so that's a beautiful thing to know if you need to bring in Force of Vigor or not when you're yeah. doing the sideboarding as opposed to hedging and guessing, which you have to do when you don't have access to the deck list. This is another animal entirely. And so here come the mills. Hobbs is going to go through the motions right along there with Mullen as Mullen continues to make more and more zombie tokens. We know a lot of this was banned away in modern, and I don't want to get too far out of myself, but do you want this kind of interaction to be legal in your legacy format if you're Wizards of the Coast? Eh, I don't know. And you do actually have to resolve some cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and something like Hedron Crab, it, the difference between it being on the battlefield for one turn or two and three turns, it matters. You know, I, I think the uh, Reanimate and Dredge decks play so much less on the battlefield than this that even though it's like powerful and Maybe not the best thing. I, I actually think the play pattern is much more desirable than Reanimator or Dredge. Well, I will say, once it gets going, it's a lot. It is a lot. You see Hobbs is going to count the rest of the cards there. So yep. that means that Mullen is going to have to sacrifice some number of zombies. It's two for each zombie he sacrifices as far as the mill is concerned. 
I think that's the whole deck. So here comes Brazen Bar. I, I admire the playing it out. And that is going to do it. Collins Mullen's going to win this game and match over Jonathan Hobbs. Two games to zero. Hogak's going to take care of Grixis Delver. And for Collins Mullen, he goes 3-0 and through legacy play. He is in.